I am beyond words right now because I am absolutely thrilled to be here in Yorkshire at the exquisite Castle Howard. <laughs> I actually can't believe I'm here. When I married into the British aristocracy, it was the start of a wonderfully exciting journey, but it was also a little daunting. I became a Viscountess, and for an American girl from a small town outside Chicago, that was quite a shock. I live with my husband, Luke, heir to the Earl of Sandwich, and our family at Mapperton House in Dorset. Living in a place like this is a joy, but also a challenge. And every day we're aware that we're preserving a very special part of Britain's heritage. Mapperton has opened up an extraordinary new world for me, and I can't wait to share it with you all. So if you love castles and manors, and stately homes as much as I do, please join this American Viscountess as I journey into the British countryside in search of some of Britain's finest historic houses. Welcome to the drawing room here at Mapperton. And it's not only the American Viscountess filming that takes place here. Over the years, Mapperton has featured as the location for films, including Far From the Madden Crowd, starring Carrie Mulligan, and more recently, Rebecca with Lily James. So many historic houses are more than happy to invite cameras in as it's sort of like the golden ticket. The income almost always enables vital repairs and renovations to be carried out. The spectacular Castle Howard in North Yorkshire was largely saved in the 1980s when it featured in the TV drama series Brides Had Revisited and has since appeared in numerous films, including a favorite of mine, the Netflix series Bridgerton. Castle Howard has been home to the Howard family since it was built over 300 years ago and I was more than a little excited when I visited and met Nick and Vicki Howard. Hello. Hello. Oh my goodness. So nice it's to meet nice you. Very nice to meet so you. Hello. Nice to meet you. This is Poppy. Poppy. Wonderful. Hello, Poppy. So nice to meet you. This is incredible. <laughs> You've not been here you know before. This. You've no. heard this a million times. Yeah, I'm going to say it again and again. I still spill it every day. <laughs> I mean, the view. The yes. The only thing is you haven't brought the sunshine, but anyway. Well, it's all right. It's England. <laughs> it's England, um, exactly. It's, it's North Yorkshire. Yeah. Very exactly. North Yorkshire. Exactly, yes. exactly. Thank you so okay. much. No. Come in. Pleasure. Yes. Come in. Perfect, yes. perfect. Thank you, thank Come you. Up. Many of you have observed my seemingly boundless energy, often liking me to the Energizer Bunny that just keeps on going. However, there are moments when I do find myself overwhelmed and in need of discussing my daily stresses with someone that I trust. And in a world that's teeming with challenges and uncertainties, prioritizing mental health has become increasingly crucial especially in the current circumstances. Mental well-being should be regarded the same significance as physical health, yet it tends to be overlooked. The pressures of daily life, work, relationships, and societal expectations can significantly impact our mental health, and I've experienced this firsthand. While we diligently work to keep our bodies healthy through physical exercise, it's equally imperative to exercise our mental health. That's why I'm thrilled today's video is in paid partnership with BetterHelp. BetterHelp is on a mission to make therapy more affordable and 
more accessible. Their online platform simplifies the process of finding a therapist. By answering just a few questions, BetterHelp can match you with a professional therapist in as little as a few days. Recognizing that finding the right therapist is akin to dating, BetterHelp allows you to switch to a new therapist at no additional cost if the initial match doesn't feel quite right. Signing up and getting matched with a therapist is so straightforward. Just check the link in my description down below, betterhelp.com forward slash American Viscountess. Clicking that link not only supports this channel, but also grants you a 10% discount on your first month of BetterHelp, giving you the opportunity to connect with a therapist and assess its impact on your well being. Similar to maintaining my physical health, I am committed to keeping my mental health in tip top shape for the entirety of my life. And I recognize the importance of both aspects in leading a healthy life. Thank you once again to BetterHelp for supporting this channel. It took over 100 years to build Castle Howard. It was commissioned by Charles Howard, the third Earl of Carlisle, at the end of the 17th century. He then chose John Vanbrugh as his architect, and Castle Howard would become the epitome of the English Baroque style. The scale of the building is astonishing, and I know all too well what it takes to maintain and preserve these historic houses. This room is lovely. This is sort of our sitting room, really. Though yeah. we do use it for some for some business things, but um, it's primarily the private yeah. part of the house. Well, yes. thank you for having me. I feel I feel honoured. The views. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Well, it's what, called it's called the lake sitting room, and you can see why it's called the lake sitting room. And um, if you get if you get an evening where the, the sky is beautifully orange. It goes on reflecting in those ponds through because there are, there's actually about 12 foot difference in height between the nearest pond and the lake itself. So it goes down like that. So you keep getting reflection coming oh, back again. No, it's, it's magical. Fantastic. And you redecorated this room, is that yeah, right? Yeah, we, re yes. we redecorated this room, yeah. Um, and I mean, really, it was one of the very earliest rooms to be built. Uh, so this room was literally built in about 1701 or something. Right. Although it wasn't in exactly this room. No, funnily no. enough, it was two rooms. And at some stage, in the, probably in the 18th century or early 19th century, they took a wall out there. Right. Because um, there was a staircase yeah, down there. So oh. it's, in, it's so fascinating, you know, I had to see the sort of development. <laughs> of, but it's been like this for a long time. Okay. It's been like okay. this for a very right. long time, yeah. But when you were growing up here, what do, what's your memory of this room? Well, this was uh, this was the my parents' sitting room as well, the lake right. sitting room, and it was called the lake sitting room. And and heaven forbid, I occasionally have called it the drawing room, and he gets so cross. It's not the drawing room; it's the lake sitting well, that's room. Well, right, the drawing room is through there. It's what, what we call the gold library now. And it's, all, it's all very confusing, yes, and very the names track. of rooms in this house have just have changed constantly throughout time. Right. I mean, and because I grew up here, of course, I tend to, I tend to slightly hang on to the names from that period. Um, but there's no reason why they shouldn't go on changing. The two of you, you've taken, you know, this extraordinary palace on, if you like. I mean, the, this is world renowned here. Everybody knows about Castle Howard. And do you feel an enormous sort of burden in one sense to leave your legacy. I mean, I know that that's kind of how yeah. I feel a little bit. Well, it's, there's a huge conservation challenge here. Um, I mean, one of the features of Castle Howard is it's not just the palace, as it were, it's all the other buildings, which is what makes it special. And they are all more than 300 years old. Right. And um, there are a lot of problems. A lot of the um, buildings were built with iron cramps in them, which they thought was a good idea in the early 18th century. Mm. As soon as water comes in, you yes. have a problem because they rust and they expand and they break the stone. So there is a, a lot of, a lot to do. Yes. And so it's a, it's a challenge, yeah. It is a big challenge. As far as prioritizing the list, if you mm. like, and I know Tricky. that that can change, Tricky. you know, up and down, it can go mm. up and down. Mm. And then things constantly 
um, get added to it. But would you say right now, what is several, because I know it's a big list, of big projects that you want to see completed? That's a, it's a very good question. I mean, obviously we want to tackle things which are deteriorating very fast because it might be too late if we leave them. Right. Um, and yes. there is that sort of stitch in time element with mm. conservation. But we also want to do projects that could potentially produce income. Yes. So have a sort of sustainability. And we've made life even more complicated for ourselves in that both Nick and I are quite interested in nature. So we're actually not just looking at the built heritage, we're also looking at the natural heritage yes. and you know what we're doing on the wider estate in terms of biodiversity and everything. Mm. So we have made the list <laughs> rather long actually. But I, I think it's absolutely right because I mean in, with buildings it's very easy to see the decay yes. that's gone on. You can't to quite the same extent see the decay that's happened to the countryside over the past, particularly the past 70 yeah. years. But we know it's there. Well, it's we know the butterfly population is yes. depleted and so many populations are depleted. So well, th th that is quite a passion for us, is to, to, to yes. restore um, the natural environment as well. Yeah. But they're, we're, they're, they go hand in hand, actually, uh, and we've got yeah. to do both. These historic houses here in the UK in particular are set within you know, an estate. Yeah. And now we are looking at ways that we can increase. And of course, in the past, that the estate produced the income to keep the house, and those estates don't actually produce <laughs> enough to support the house. So you have to, you know, so we find all... other other ways of yeah. supporting the house. So not yeah. only do we open up the yeah. house to the public, but then we have events, Fil exhibitions, filming, and filming all of that and, exactly. And so. you're constantly trying to evolve yeah. in in as the as the homeowner, but with new ideas. The country house in Britain changed forever during the 20th century. It's said that in 1955, one house was demolished every five days. Therefore, historic homeowners were forced to be creative and innovative, with many opening the doors of their manors, castles, and stately homes to the public. These owners did all they could to save these buildings for the future. Historic Houses, the association, which now represents more than 1,400 privately owned houses across the UK, has noted that some 21 million visits were made to these properties last year alone. And that's after the challenges of the recent history, the COVID pandemic, when once again, we all needed to think outside the box. We were able to take on, I think, the pandemic as hard and difficult as it was, we were forced mm. to find new ways. Well, that, to... it's amazing how much that often does change the course of things. Yes. We all the big houses now um, open for Christmas. Yes. Um, and Christmas is an incredibly important part financially of our year. But really, the sort of whole business of opening for Christmas was an accident because um, was there, was, there was a foot and mouth outbreak in Chatsworth decided because they'd lost so much over the year because of the foot and mouth. They had to close. That, they, that yeah. they would try opening at Christmas and see what happened. And they were inundated with people. And everyone went, ooh, we might right. try that. But you know, this whole business of kind of, of, of you talked about, you talked about legacy, we talked yeah. about looking after the place. It goes back to the meaning of the word heritage, really, which is, I mean, I bang on about this, but if you look heritage up, um, in a decent dictionary, you'll find that it means what has been or may be inherited. And it could, as, I mean, as custodians, you know, we're kind of on the fulcrum of that definition. Mm. It's, yes. if, we, if we don't look forward as well as backwards, then eventually it's going to it's going to implode. The whole thing. Yes, you have to keep you have to keep innovating. You have to keep finding new ways of doing things. You have to find new streams of income. You have to find new people to come and see you. Yes, and new audiences. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. very important. On the 9th of November, 1940, fire savaged the central and southeastern wing of Castle Howard. The destruction is still evident today as the recovery continues, but this moment also beckoned in an era of finding new ways of rebuilding the past. 
Dr. Christopher Ridgway, curator at Castle Howard for 40 years, explained more. So, Dr. Chris, tell me about where we are now, because this is quite This is the center of the house. It's the Great Hall with the crowning dome on top, which is the great architectural signature about Castle Howard. This is the second version, if you right. like, from the original one built in 1699, but lost in 1940. And then Nick Howard's father, George Howard, rebuilt the dome in 1960. In, wow, incredible. So with the dome being lost for 20 years, how many other rooms were lost in, in the house? That the castle. terrible <laughs> morning on the 9th of November, 1940, you, you've got a tally of about 20 rooms that are destroyed on three levels, basement, principal, and upper. Right. Sections of the roof and the dome. And to date, we have restored fully, really fully, right. four of those rooms. The central block has been re-roofed and obviously the dome rebuilt. Uh, there's been consolidation work in the interiors, but there is more to do, right. which will be done. Uh, oh, so that was going to be my next question. Will those rooms that haven't been finished, and of course this is time and lots of money and time and yeah. lots of money, and I can say that over and over again, but for those remaining what, about 16 rooms, there is a plan for them to eventually be There rebuilt. is. Um, we've got one downstairs which we're on the cusp of kind of restoring is to an early 18th century drawing room. Fantastic. We have other areas that require much, much more work and have different options about what we do with them. And I can show you that when yes. we go into the older burnt out <gasps> wing. Wow. I mean, that fire in November 1940 was brutal. It's almost hard to fathom how the magnificent central dome was lost and 20 rooms destroyed. This is the shell of the High South. So High South comprised this central saloon with two bedroom suites either side. And this, these were so prestigious that this is where Queen Victoria and Prince Albert stayed when they visited in right. 1850. Oh and my goodness. the walls in here, this section, were decorated with these frescoes by Antonio Pellegrini, who also decorated the walls of the hall and the underside of the dome. Of course, all incinerated in 1940. So what you have is the bare stone right. remains. The bare stone remains, in, I mean, incredible. I can see though why Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were yes. staying here because this yeah. sensational Sensational view, view this way, sensational view that exactly. way, south over the grounds and then to the villages right. beyond. So how did the fire start? That's always intriguing. We hear about these fires you yeah. know, in these country houses quite a bit. Competing stories, yeah. um, because <laughs> during the Second World War, a girls' school had been evacuated to Castle Howard. Very common that buildings like this were requisitioned yes. for different purposes. So a girls' school was here. Um, actually, it was a chimney fire. Um, chimneys had probably been not as well maintained, and that's what was the likely cause of it. There are some competing stories about an electrical fault, which may or may not have been the case. There's colorful kind of versions that the girls in a fit of St. Trinian's like kind of irresponsibility right. burnt the house down. Afraid that's not true, <laughs> no. It's much more prosaic and, and chimney fires are kind of unbelievably common in yes. country house fires. Yes, they are. It effectively started in the southeast wing. There was a, a wind blowing that sort right. of fanned the flames into the center of the building. Where we are today. Yeah. I, I guess for me, with living in a historic house myself, Many times when you have these fires and they are so significant, you almost think of just giving up There's, because the rebuild is so costly. The rebuild is, is horrific, I mean, yeah. it's daunting. Here you have to layer in another very difficult factor. This is in the middle of the war and of the three sons in the family, two are to die in the war. So Nick's father, who is the middle son, returns from the Far East never expecting to inherit Castle yes. Howard. He does, but it's partially wrecked. Um, and as you say, a, a lot of people would have said no. Yes, right. But the girls' school stayed here for a few more years. There were uh, attempts for them to try and buy the building, 
But Nick's father makes the decision at the end of the 1940s that he wants to move back in right. to be his family home. He will raise his family here. And then really crucially, in 1952, he makes this decision amongst the vanguard of, of, of country house owners to open to the public mm -hmm. in the way that we understand right. it today. Yeah. So this is a great survivor. I mean, this is that's the yes, great thing. It is. It's both the house and the family yes. are joint survivors and they both need each other. Yeah. As we explored the area of the house which had been consumed by the fire, we reached the rooms which are being saved for future generations. This is the room that is on the cusp of being restored is back it? to a tapestry drawing room and recreate a historic interior here. Big challenge, got to find a new fireplace, build a new fireplace that's in keeping with that early 18th century feel for this room. Um, we have the tapestries which are being oh, uh, restored at the moment, so that, that's great, but we've got to put all the panelling back into the yes, room. Yes, you have to go. So yeah. can I ask about the tapestries? Yeah. When the fire happened in here, were the tapestries completely destroyed? No. What happened here, that this room had gone, through, so many rooms have gone through different iterations over time. Right. So at the time of the fire, the tapestries were not in this room. Ah, And okay. at the time of the fire, because the girls' school was here, Fortunately, a lot of stuff was away in store. Having said that, quite a lot of stuff wasn't. Big fixtures like heavy mirrors and sculptures right. couldn't be moved and fixture paintings, all of those perished in the fire. I mean, a long list of paintings lost, you know, right. really tragic. Right, yes, but yes. There have been survivors and losses and, and it's a question of kind of putting back together what we can uh, right. and recreating this room. And so that means you will have an uninterrupted suite of rooms here. At the moment, you come from that room, which is recreated after the fire, to this shell back, back. to the historic interior. Back. So we'll remove this kind of hiatus and right. put it back with the rest of the house. How fantastic. So again, you just spoke about the room in front of me, that that was recreated after the fire. That was recreated in a very special way. Um, it was rebuilt, the shell was rebuilt for the set for Brideshead Revisited <gasps> by Granada TV. Oh my goodness. So this, again, just so in my mind's eye, this room very much looked like this. Exactly like that. So TV comes in, TV right? comes in, late 70s, films Brideshead here for us. Uh, a really, you know, significant moment in the history of Castle Howard. Yes. Catapults us to global fame. Yes, yes, you know. yes. So this is an opportunity for these historic houses to be the location, the set, and that, that of course, was a new way of bringing in income to support. Income and fame and reputation. Yeah. And clearly Brideshead is very important because the story of Brideshead is, is a love affair with a house, yeah. um, and it's a house in the in the novel that has a dome, so we fit the bill. <laughs> yes. And Evelyn Waugh did visit Castle Howard in the 30s. He didn't have Castle Howard explicitly in mind as a model for Brideshead, but architecturally in all, in all sorts of ways there are affinities between right. fictional and real building. So this room, I'm just curious, when they decided to restore this room, why was that? Why this room? Because of the view out to there? Is, yeah, yeah. It's, it's because you've got the view back into the Great Hall, yep. you've got the view and the steps down into the right. gardens. And you've got, the, for a TV company, you've got the best of both worlds. You've got, as it were, an authentic set all around you, but you've got a shell in which you can build your own set. Yes. And this is largely what it looked like in the production, except these murals were then replaced. So in, in TV version, this is where Jeremy Irons is, is, is executing his murals for, for the Marchmain family. Those are replaced by these pictures commissioned from the New Zealand artist Felix Kelly by okay. Nick's father, George Howard, post-production. So this doesn't recreate anything that was like here before. This is a new iteration of yes. this room, post-fire, late 20th century, in keeping with the fact that this house is organic. It evolves, it evolves. all the time. That's right. Yeah. Even before Brides Had Revisited was first broadcast in 1981, Castle Howard had played its part in many, many productions, and that continues to this day. 
Vicki Howard showed me a room which is featured on screen more than once. We're going into a bedroom that's called the Archbishop's bedroom. Right. And God knows why it's called the Archbishop's bedroom. Just <laughs> be called that forever. <laughs> it's one of those names yeah, I know that yeah. nobody really understands yeah. why, but yes. it's stuck. Beautiful. <sighs> So obviously there's been a huge amount of filming at yeah. Castle Had and it's a very important extra income stream for us. It also, of course, uh, widens our reach of visitors. It's a great mm. marketing tool yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. But the most famous of all is Brideshead. Right. So this was the bed that very famously Lord Marchmain, played by Sir Laurence Olivier, um, died in. Oh my goodness. And the bed was actually rehung for Brideshead. These are the all new silks and things that Brideshead put up oh. for the filming in this room. Fantastic. And so this for sort of film buffs is very important. But then it had a second life recently in that um, it was in Bridgerton, in the first series of Bridgerton. Yes. And it's the bed that the marriage of the mm -hmm. Duke and Daphne was consummated in. That's so right. So there were many, many scenes <gasps> filmed all night in this bed. <laughs> But anyway, so this bed has got has quite a lot of film it, history atta yes, attached to it. Quite a lot of action. I mean, listen, <laughs> yes. I recognize this bed because I've seen both. Okay, yeah. So, um, okay. so I feel yeah, a little bit yeah, of a, yeah, exactly. an affinity with, it, with this bed. But also, the bed itself, the four press bed, yeah. is absolutely yeah. exquisite. Yeah. So, it what's is. the history? Just, around, I mean, it's beautifully. Well, for some yeah. reason, yes, I mean, there's gorgeous yes, painting. Go gorgeous. I mean, you see, it's, it's absolutely beautifully done. For some reason, we've got a lot of these. They call them Polynes beds. I'm not quite sure why. Um, but anyway, they're, they're, they're very sort of French, actually, in style. Mm. At some stage, someone put in an order for a lot of them, I think. Right, right, right. <laughs> I know, you know. Again, the importance of having TV, film. Yeah. Hugely, hugely yeah. important. Bridgerton, I mean, wonderful. Yeah. Because well, it's... a surprise, too. I mean, we didn't really realise how big it was going to be. But I do think it was very well done, actually. Mm. I think it was refreshing. Suddenly this came along yeah. and it was fun and different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was brilliant. There's Poppy, look it. Oh! oh. <laughs> the income from these blockbuster film projects is absolutely vital for the ongoing repairs and restoration needed to preserve these historic houses. Vicky took me to a room she has recently redecorated, which will itself be put to work to replenish the coffers. This is the Admiral's room, and we have very recently redecorated this. And, and the reason that we redecorated it was this fabric, mm. which is an Indian fabric, which we have re reproduced the pattern from one that was in our archive, which we know was here in the 19th century. And so we've done a collection of fabrics this is the Castle Howard, <gasps> Indiana. Um, so we needed to showcase it. Yes, of course. So, so we redecorated the room in order to showcase. <laughs> it's fantastic. The so if yeah. I wanted to redecorate a room at Mapperton, I could yeah, you get can the, I, buy. You <laughs> can actually buy. I mean, what's quite interesting is you can sort of see actually with the curtains maybe even more. It, it's big scale this, yes. which yes. is of course for this house perfect. Yeah. When you decided to sort of choose this room yeah. to redecorate? Yeah. Was it in desperate need of redecoration? It, or it, it, yeah, it, we didn't terribly like the decoration that was in here. Right, so right. That, that sort of helped. <laughs> We've been longing for an excuse to redecorate it. Um, obviously, as you know, decorating these rooms is always, you know, phenomenally expensive. But this yeah. was quite simple. I mean, actually, as you see, we've just put you know, we've just painted the panelling. It's got a slightly early feel with the panelling. Yeah. So painting was kind of suitable. And then of course, we've got this rather wonderful um, rush yes. matting. Now this is, and you, I don't know if you can smell it. Because I can. actually, yeah, it's got all these herbs in it. <gasps> no. And it's literally stitched. They're literally sections yes. that are stitched together. Yes. And it's very suitable. The house 
This was started to be built right at the end, literally at the cusp of the 17th and 18th century. And this, I think, has quite a sort of late 17th century feel with the panelling and the rush matting. So it's got a sort of slightly early style. Right. Um, most of the house is a little, you know, more 18th century, but we thought it was quite nice to, to do one of the rooms as it would have been in the very sort of early bit yes. of built. Because the house took 100 years to build. So. Yes, it <laughs> uh, Yes. Just to show you through to the bathroom. The bathroom has the most amazing view. Of course, this the shutters are exquisite. shut, which doesn't Ooh, help. Wow. Uh, but it's got one of the best views views in the house. Is this open to the public? Well, this... it's not open to the public, though we do do it's on that we do, do private tours. Right. There, and we're doing particularly ones on decoration. But actually, we are hoping a sort of new business model to have paying guests. So we are actually looking to actually use some of the rooms yes. um, for sort of very art market B&B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. of course, yeah, absolutely. So, and who so, and want... this, and so this obviously with its nice bathroom and everything works very well. It's a room to, to, to let. Castle Howard was built to be seen. It was not built as a little private house. Right. It was built as a show-off house. Yes, but yes. It was, you know, and, and they actually extended uh, the gatehouse, which you probably drove through, to mm. turn it into a guest house in, and because they had so many people coming to see the new Castle Howard. They needed right. more accommodation to put people up. So, you know, these houses were always yeah, teeming with people and That's people right. coming to see it and yeah. everything. Well, lovely. This is um, absolutely beautiful and you've done such a marvelous job. Now, I do have to ask, you've finished this room. Mm. What's next? Well, the, the <laughs> next, the big, there are even bigger projects next. So we're turning, there was a terrible fire here during the Second World War, which gutted hugely important mm. rooms. And um, those are slowly, very slowly being um, returned to their former glory. I feel like I'm one of the first, am I one of the first in this room? Yes, yeah. yes, 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 you are, yeah. yes. Yeah, <laughs> feeling a little bit special. Thank you, Vicky. <laughs> Castle Howard has risen like a phoenix from the ashes. So much has been restored over the past 80 years or so. But Dr. Chris Ridgway promised to show me a hidden area which was ravaged by the fire and is still to be restored. Dr. Chris, this is, I mean, on the one hand, incredible to see this, but on the other hand, you can't help but feeling sort of a bit of sadness, you know. You are here. I mean, this is the basement of the southeast wing of the house. So this is the area in which the fire broke out in 1940 and right. then swept through into the body of the house. And so you go into these rooms here. Now these would have been... Yeah, what would these rooms have been? These were domestics rooms um, in the 19th century. So this was the housekeeper's room originally. Okay. Um, and then through there you've even got the butler's pantry. So that would have been the silver safe. Oh, so yes. the great big iron door would have protected the interior. That's why those ceramic tiles are actually still unscathed still by the fire. And was the silver in there? Not no. in the time of the war, right. no. But right. very often in, in houses yes. that did catch fire, the silver survived because it was in the strong room that right. was able to kind of um, yeah, no, no, of protect course. it. Yeah. Of course. So. Just walking through here, th this fire was so extensive. Very I mean. extensive, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is it, just the basement level. So these were domestic rooms and used during the fire, used? Well, the or, whole of the building had been institutionalized by the school during yes. the fire. So I don't know, think these were classrooms or dormitories as such, but they would have been maybe for storage areas or, or, or things like that. So, and here, for example, in this space, up there is roughly where the fire began. <gasps> now, you, you can't tell that from no. now because no, no, a lot no. of things were had lost. And, and it was somewhere around there that the chimney flue was that started the fire. And that's not there today. You've got this cavernous shell some post-fire consolidation with brickwork and concrete lintels just to stabilise the structure, to stabilize. stop it falling down. Yes. And this wooden staircase is just for when we briefly had this open as a sort of standalone exhibition wing. Um, but 
more to do in this area, not least of all with the roof, because the roof is still a temporary oh, I, roof. I can see yeah. that. Um, oh, I've just spotted yeah. that. It is a temporary So you're, you're never going to do anything until you've got a, a solid roof on top. Right. Uh, and these windows right here, are they temporary windows, structures? Yeah, they are windows that were put in post-fire. So actually, immediately after the fire, all the windows have been burnt out, the glass shattered. Right. So those new sash windows in the 40s, 50s would have gone in just to kind of, again, protect the area from the elements but in time those are going to have to be replaced of properly yeah of course. I mean, and nothing here really is kind of permanent in in the sense that we've got to sort of start from scratch when we come to yes. redoing this area yes. and not least of all this end room which is again another <gasps> cavernous space oh look at this um, oh my goodness and the light is fantastic i think for me this is one of the most poignant spaces because the the, the floor which is lost that reveals the room above, known as the little cabinet. This east-facing room, so beautiful morning light in here, decorated ceiling, all lost. No, I mean, as tragic as, as the other yeah. historic interiors lost, but this is something particularly gaunt about this spectacle here yeah. today. And again, as a space, I think, because it's connection with the outside and the gardens, maybe there, there are kind of possibilities in here temporarily, but yes. it's yes. part of that list of things to do. I think crucial thing to realize is that since the fire we have spent an awful lot of money and time on restoring the house the structures in the gardens i mean if you add it up in today's values we've probably spent 40 million pounds over the years right you look at what's outstanding yeah. that's another 50 yeah. 60 million yes but you know what we've we've, we've accomplished that much right. it's the old glass half empty half full right and but it's also being able to i think continue to tell the story because this project as you said is you know this fire happened in 1940 we're now in 2023 and it's been as you said 40 million pounds or whatever been spent to, to get to where you've gotten to today you might look at this space and you think this, this is dead actually this is a living house it's yeah. it's, it's all the time it's evolving it's moving forward it's not standing still it's not crumbling it takes a lawful lot of effort, dedication and, and money to do that. But the wherewithal, the will is there. That's yes. the critical thing. Yes. For me, I think Castle Howard, of course, it's, listen, it's famous. I'm gonna use that word. You know, it is world renowned, but what's extraordinary about coming here is that as a visitor, each time I come, I'm gonna see something different if I come every year. And it's not just a new exhibition. I can start to see really how the house is evolving because of the fire with yeah. these ongoing projects yeah. all yeah. of the time. The fire presents you with a whole lot of opportunities. Of course, there are massive challenges, but there are opportunities to restore and refresh the building, refresh the stories, the narratives, because yes. this is a building that's a story house as much as a treasure house. Yes. Uh, and it kind of confirms that evolutionary dynamic so that rooms are not necessarily put back to how they were before. Uh, the irony being that the more you restore, the less of the fire is visible, but it's always going to be part of our story. Yes. And yes, you're right. Come back in five years' time, ten years' time, we might have restored this bit. And that's happened in my time here. You know, The lakes have been all restored and recovered. Other parts of the estate, mm. other parts of the building. It's the stories that can be told. So the next project is this. We're working on this, we're with the architects and even sharing that story that yeah. this will be completely transformed in two years time, five years time, exactly. come back. And there's an endless story yes. to be told yeah. about it. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for joining me and I hope you enjoyed the first installment of my visit to the stunning Castle Howard. Be sure to join me soon when I'll be getting out the history books in the kitchen with Nick Howard and taking in more of the glories of the house and the estate. In the meantime, do please consider becoming an American Viscountess patron. Here you'll get early access to all of these videos, plus they're ad-free and lots of American Viscountess merchandise as well. Details down below at patreon.com forward slash American Viscountess. Hope to see you soon back here in the drawing room at Mapperton. Bye, everybody.